Everything we know, from people and ants, to stars and galaxies, to quarks and atoms, the entire universe, might just be a simulation running inside a supercomputer, inside an even bigger universe. Ancient philosophers said that the universe is a dream that we're waiting to wake up from. In this dream world of the imagination, anything is possible. All cultural items, from the dreams of our rodent-like ancestors, to books, to television shows, are merely permutations of the reality we think we live in. Today's age of computers and video games places simulations at the center of our cultural consciousness. A select group of us perform simulations for fun and profit, and we call them games, role-playing and otherwise. We live to run simulations. Join us on the Simulationist podcast as we explore our culture of simulations. Hello, welcome back once again to the Simulationist podcast. This is the 114th, 115th, 115th iteration of the podcast. It is the 16th of November, 2014. Remember, name, remember the 16th of November <laughs> because the rhyme works with every day. In November and also yeah. December. Any ember it works with. October, no, October is not a month. It Anyways. could be. <laughs> Start a new calendar. Um, and my name is Josh Levin, as it always is. I'm uh, uh, joined by... Uh, Co-host uh, extraordinaire, Ryan Kirkby. As we are every week. Uh, hey, Ryan, how's it going? It's doing pretty darn good this week uh, for me. Um, had some fun, interesting things going on. Uh, the big thing for those around the Victoria area was the recent elections. Oh, yes. Uh, now, I'm drama. technically not part of Victoria, so I can't vote for Victoria. I'm living just on the other side of the border in Esquimalt. Or for those who <laughs> don't live anywhere near the area, Esquimalt. Um, and so I wasn't able to vote on the mayor, you know, and who that was. But as it turns out, the incumbent mayor got unseated by, from what I saw on the CBC News, 89 votes. Yes, a close race. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, this really shows how important in a democracy it is sometimes, especially on the civic end of things, to vote. Because if, if you could have convinced 100 people to vote for the incumbent mayor, he'd still be the mayor instead of the new person. True, yeah. And, I mean, I could potentially sway 10 people easily on that sort of thing, going out and <laughs> yeah. say, hey, you know, vote... Vote for Mayor Fortin. He's not as bad as you might think. <laughs> I could sway ten people. So if you get yeah. nine other people like me, we could have swung the vote. We could have changed who the uh, the mayor was going to be. That's true. Well, and I, I mean, there were a bunch of people who... That's the reason why the mayor who did get elected did, ended up getting elected was because she had a team of people who were convincing. To and... Just convincing <laughs> enough. <laughs> and she did have the nice surname of Helps. As in, you know, I am a mayor who helps. Yeah. So I, I'm pretty certain at least some people filled in the ballot. Just oh, this mayor helps. Okay, I like that. Although I have to say, like helps is one of those um, you don't like to see it on uh, medication bottles because it helps it with this. Helps, and it, it doesn't actually, you know, it doesn't cure. It doesn't. Uh, well, 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 instead of medication, <laughs> think of it as something like for like uh, get rid of dandruff. You know, when when you're like uh, looking at your shampoo bottles and all that. Do you want something that's proven to fight dandruff or something that helps against dandruff? <laughs> Yeah, uh, you'll pay the extra ten cents for the you know the scientific study that shows it helps. I mean, I yeah, I want proven, but I not I that I get dandruff, <laughs> but I, I don't think I get dandruff. Isn't everybody? Uh, well, okay, given the, the drier winter months, maybe I get something. I I've never had anybody. I mean, mention not like it. majors, but yeah, yeah. it's clearly um, not a perennial problem for me. Uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, about helps helping. Um, yeah, I think I think most people are sort of comforted by the word because it is a, a positive word. But I just always, as like sort of a skeptic, I'm like, uh, helps. Yeah, that's not what I want. I don't want something just to help. I want something to actually do something. And I mean, but a good, good on this uh, per, uh, new mayor for getting in. I mean, um, not only was the the mayor, you know, running again, who had been elected the last two times, so he was like a twice victor, going for mm-hmm. his, you know, I guess, uh, hat trick of. of mayoral winnings. Mm-hmm. Um, so he had an advantage there? Yes. Uh, he, well, and the thing is, is uh, one of the other candidates was uh, one of the uh, MPs for B- uh, British Columbia, Ida Chong. And she's got some like name power recognition. You, know, you see Ida Chong on a ballot here in, in BC. And you say, Ida Chong, I know her. Is she the incumbent? What was she doing? I don't know. I remember the name, though. She, I remember her doing good stuff. She was in the news. Nothing bad on that one. So I'll, I'll circle that one. That's a good mm-hmm. vote. 
but apparently not good enough as she did not win. And of course, changes the clown. Was oh yes, a yes. Candidate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, see, the weird thing is, is that he wasn't a serious candidate. Changes the clown. On the other hand, I did go to the Victoria, you know, .ca website, and I checked out like the list of mayoral candidates for Victoria. And changes the clown had an image man and a clown sort of thing going on. It was actually him. Mm-hmm. And it had a description of what he believes sort of thing. Whereas some other mayoral candidates had a name, no image provided, no description provided. So Changes the Clown was still, even though a joke candidate, technically better than some of the other candidates because he gave enough of a darn to say to the, you know, the Victoria website, you know, like, uh, here's a photo of me to use <laughs> and here's this. <clears throat> You know, this is what I stand for. And some people just didn't care enough to do that. They apparently had some other plan to become mayor. But um, I guess it wasn't good enough because they aren't. Mayor helps as the new mayor. Mm -hmm. Well, I find it... uh, Okay, uh, I don't know. Should we keep talking about politics and stuff? Uh, Well, in this case, it was just such a nice close call. It really does illustrate the power of voting in a democracy sometimes. Just how much one vote can sway. If, you know, you had voted for the incumbent mayor, that one vote would have been 1% and change of the goal needed for him to become mayor in this case. A hundred yep. people more voting in the election could have swayed everything. Yep, and, and of course, like, I like to say, well, I, I like to preach, but I don't know how much I practice, but the idea with living in a de- democracy is, yes, you vote, or, I mean, if you feel that you... I th- I think people should vote. I mean, yeah, I don't want to compel people to vote, but I think that it's a good idea. Uh, but that's only the start of democracy. Mm-hmm. And because often, like so many times, the person you vote for, you know, doesn't get in or whatever. So a- after that, like, you sort of, you participate in other ways. You, I don't know, you write letters or you um, go to meetings, although I never go to meetings. See, this is why I'm preaching, but not actually practicing <laughs> Because, in theory, like, you can do more in a democracy than just vote. Like, voting well, I've, is the I've put my minimum. name in for, like, a few, like, oh, we need to, you know, like, uh, study what to do with the urbanized deer. And I'm like, well, I have a degree in this sort of field. I could help out very well with, you oh, know, yeah. like, about urbanized and, you know, uh, less, you know, not domesticated, but still feral populations and all that. And so I put my name in the hat for, you know, going on with, uh, like, a council group to, to work with that. But I never got uh, chosen for it, so... Uh, even though I've tried and failed, at least I tried. Yep, cool. So, so yeah, that's local <laughs> stuff. Uh, local politics. I hope everybody is still listening. Uh, well, I mean, in this case, it's, it's just such an, an excellent example. It doesn't need to uh-huh. be like local politics. Because um, let, let's face it, when, when George Bush got into uh, in the presidency uh, originally, it was over effectively like one riding in Florida hmm. was all that made the difference. They're the people that helped decide which one of the two it was. Yeah, and maybe not even the people, but more the the um, the uh, election counters and and the. Court and I still people. have my suspicions <laughs> about those counters. I saw them counting, you know, ballots, and they're going through the whole thing, and then they're looking at each other and talking, and it's like, <laughs> no, 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 no. Ballots are down there in between your hands. Don't look over at this other person. You're determining the fate of America. Uh, it's funny too. If I can hang get the chads too, back to. Uh, <laughs> Victoria for a second here our local it's um it was all done sort of ele- well it wasn't you don't use a computer to vote but you fill in a card and then you you black out the spaces and whatever and uh, completely it's black it out make sure it's proper <laughs> yeah and then you stick it in a machine and the machine instantly counts it right I was very impressed with that yeah uh, so and that's a bonus <laughs> you know it's like uh, I, I fed it in with the machine it goes zip on through there and it's like no like I have to worry like okay now what happens with you know like everything I wrote on there in the old box it's like how am I certain this box is actually going to go where it's needed what if it disappears somewhere someone says oh this you know yeah, well... Take it off somewhere, remove a few things, and then put, you know, okay, this is the mayor candidate I want in. <laughs> then the box goes back into circulation, and, oh, hey, so many more votes for the person they wanted. This way, you know, zip, it's now registered. Your vote is in with a tally. And if they well, need to back yeah. up, there's the boxes as a backup. They can double-check everything later on. That's true. They could do a recount. Um, and like Which they <laughs> might very well do for Victoria in a matter of something like, I think, I think it was 89 votes was the, the yeah. actual end tally. That's close enough where they'll do it just as a matter of, of, of 
perfection just in case. Yeah, I think they might, but I was yeah, I was thinking about like whether, you know, that would be appropriate. And I, I think kind of if you're going on the assumption that the machines are counting correctly, you probably don't need to recount because the machine would be very accurate. Uh, well, in which case, you just uh, like uh, say, okay, let's double check to make sure everything works. We'll uh, open up one box out of five here, and we'll see this person clearly voted for this, and then we'll run a few through to make sure it counts everything properly. Okay. In which case, it's like, okay, yes, in these uh, like 20 cases we, we put it through, it was all registering it properly, so it's not like it was reading incorrectly. This one's fine. Everything from this one uh, machine is considered fine. In that case, all they have to do is check to make sure all the machines were reading properly. Yeah. And in that case, you don't have to recount every single dang vote. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And uh, like, I do worry. Like, yes, it's in some ways like it takes a little bit of that human error out, but it's also like there is a very. I, I mean, this is not likely to happen because there are safeguards. No one's hacking the system. But I I am thinking that there is a possibility that if someone who wrote the software could like sneak something in and I believe this happened somewhere in the states at one point I think there might have been a movie about it with uh, Robin Williams <laughs> okay yeah but yeah th in theory like one person could just get into the the data and alter that and then you wouldn't have to worry about you know who voted and when and all that stuff you just you mess with that the software a little bit mm -hmm. and you could get a result you wanted but this is a nice mix between you know the error all error, it's all digital all you do is push a button and it's all done versus you know the old-fashioned way in which case a digital stuff reads out and if anyone has any problems anyone raises say hey i don't believe this is accurate we have the physical backup to prove it okay. and then once yeah. everyone's okay and done well you burn all the old copies because yeah. you don't need that much stuff stored space wise and we live in a we live in a place where we basically we trust <laughs> for some r strange reason, but our politicians are not. Or as the difference as between the, the politicians <laughs> are so minor we don't need to care. Or our electoral process seems to mostly work. Even like like uh, to talk about there more. were police officers outside the voting areas uh, making sure everything was going on nice and uh, uh -huh. on the level. So I was happy to see that. Yeah, and we have rules and 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 you know this and that. Um, but yeah, even in the last election, we had a few like hiccups, you know, robocalls and stuff like mm. that. But it wasn't really widespread. It was just sort of here and there in the country. Well, heck, for me, I, I originally went to the wrong voting location. I, I skipped over on the border and I went to the Victoria area. And it's like, oh, oh no, wait, this is the wrong area. Well, I guess we'll have to go find the right spot. And it wasn't because like I had been waylaid by you know Pierre Poutine sent me like an email <laughs> saying you got to go to this location. It's just an honest, honest mistake. Uh, I just went to look, look at all the voting locations and said, oh, this one's, I think, fairly close to where I am. I'll just go this way. Mm -hmm. uh, because a block away from that, there's a wonderful, you know, chicken on the run uh, place, and we'll get some nice fried chicken and wedges when we're done. Ha <laughs> ha! Voting works in my favor. But, uh... This podcast brought to you by... Well, it's not. Not really. Uh, <laughs> Maybe we could have Hey, I had a too. really good meal from that, and I, I have so much more energy because I had a good meal. So, technically brought that way, but not, you know, like they're funding us. Right. I had to pay for the chicken still. <laughs> like a savage! Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, we, we wound up having to, to go to a proper location for the whole thing. Proper location. So, uh, but... In the riding I am a member yeah, of. Yeah, in Esquimalt, did yeah. your... Your race was not so close? Mm, no, no, no. Okay. At least not newsworthy enough for it to pop up on the CBC website when okay. I check it in the morning. Yeah. But in the end, everyone wins because it was a democracy and, and those who cared enough to vote did vote. And those who didn't care enough to vote, well, thank you for you know getting out of the way. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. And uh, yeah, like I say, it, it, it doesn't stop after voting. It, that's where you begin and... As a citizen, uh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, as a citizen, you have more duties than just voting, but, uh, yeah. It's a nice start, and if you good got start. kids, it's a good spot to take them, because they get, like, a sticker, like, future voter, hooray. Yep, yep. Um, so that's always nice. Plus, I mean, when we were done voting, at the proper location, uh, we went to, you know, across in the local community center, and we got to watch the, like, uh, the people swimming in the swimming area, and my daughter seemed to quite like it, so I got an idea in my head now. So because I voted, I have an idea, maybe next year for my daughter, what she can do to blow off some energy in the winter months, so take her to the pool. Yeah. Or, or just Swimming lessons, yeah. pool, splashing around. Cool. Let her, you know, exhaust herself that way. I'll sit offside, I'll read a book she plays. I get some reading done in. Uh, we go back home, she's super tired, she has a nice early evening, and ah, I get to relax with the, the lady of my life. So hey, that's a nice idea in my head. 
because I voted. <laughs> okay. Might be a karmic bonus for voting. I don't think everyone got that sort of like a good idea in their head for, I'll do this within the next coming year. But if they didn't, that was their own fault for not being imaginative. Nah. But yes, uh, I suppose we should get going on what we've been doing <laughs> yeah, well, this week. What we've been simulating in the imaginary world. Enough of this real world junk. <laughs> uh, well, unless you believe, you know, the whole thing that uh, voting is a fraud and it doesn't really matter how you go, in which case, technically, the voting was at least Ooh. as fictional as anything else. Oh, I like that. Yeah. You have, have to be a clown. <laughs> you have to be pessimistic for that one, though, to, to, to actually believe that. I, can I say one more thing about um, thing? about elections? I just love how... Everybody had to, like, we can laugh about change of the ground, ah, we can, or we can say, oh, yeah, he's got a good point, or, you know, because he, he does, does bring up serious issues, it's just in a weird way. He brings it up <laughs> in a farcical tone, so that way people don't get uh, offended or on the defensive for the whole thing. Um, yeah. They present it, uh, well, it's the same way like John Stewart and uh, Stephen Colbert with their humorous news programs, they'll poke at fun at anyone. Do they love Obama? Are they lefties? No. If Obama says something funny or stupid, they'll make fun of him too. Mm -hmm. They'll make fun of everyone and they'll make sure it's humorous because that way everyone has a good laugh and then, hey, they just put some information in your head. Now you're thinking about it. You're laughing and smiling as you're thinking about it, but it's in your head now. Yeah. They got you. Uh, yeah, and I was watching some of the, uh, like, uh, some of the debates and some of the public stuff where they were like presenting the candidates and it's funny because the news organizations, they have to say changes the clown with a straight completely straight face and just it's funny because it's like oh you know here's dean fortune and he's done the mayorship for so many years and blah blah, blah. and here's another person who's a professor and this other person's a radio personality and changes the clown and the 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 tone of the voice does not change one which bit. i almost think to be a little bit of a shame because i mean if i was an announcer i'd try to be as <laughs> professional as possible the uh, incumbent mayor, Dean Fortin, here, you know, had some uh, controversies within the last term, uh, given the homeless population. But other than that, uh, they've after they trashed his house a little bit, everyone considered it fair game. Everything was uh, on uh, neutral and even terms, and things progressed on normally. But then you get changes of clown. I want to switch it over to, to being like a, like a carny barker. And up next is the amazing, the one and only... Changes the clown! <laughs> Bring up the, such relevant topic issues, and that's da-da-da-da! <laughs> I uh, I like that thought. <laughs> and then we go back to the professional tone as we get the professor coming in. This <laughs> I like that too, that he would like be able to elevate his tone like up and then back down. To <laughs> straight back uh, into one the of the normal. candidates I, I saw, I mean, may not have had the best you know profile picture because my, my wife noticed it. It's like, like, uh, you know, like well, what's up with that guy sort of thing as I was scrolling through the, the candidates. And mm -hmm. uh, he was uh, like a student from, from UVic. He's on his fourth year of this and that, but he's still, you know, got enough energy and uh, the funds to, you know, properly put in, you know, because it's not free to just run to for Mary. I mean, you got, you got to put up or shut up a little bit. Something, yeah. yeah. It's not a whole lot, but it's enough to prove that you're not just like a joke candidate. That even changes the clown, <laughs> put up enough that joke candidate, kind of, but still, you know, serious enough to take, you know, as in that regard. Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, he didn't have the best haircut. He wasn't, you know, like a Photoshop, or, you know, like, ah, they, they bleached his teeth and all that for the purposes of the photos showing for everyone. But uh, he gave enough of a darn. He gave enough <laughs> of a darn to go in with that beard and that <laughs> shirt and take that <laughs> photo and submit it as his photo for everyone to see. Um, but you know what? At least he tried. He gave it enough. He says, I, I want to do this. I want to try and, and, you know, and affect positive change. I want to become the next mayor. Yeah, was this the guy who was also like the, who was saying that he needed to abolish the mayorship and all the government or something? Like no, no, this was a, a very guy. serious candidate uh, oh, okay. from what I was able to see. Um, fourth year UVic serious. student sort of thing. Um, let's see, I think it was engineering and uh, geology, geography, something like that. Uh, some of the good hard courses, not nothing that you take just frivolously because like I've got money to spare. No, this was like a real degree sort of thing. And so he would have wound up being like a, a university student and mayor. Which, I mean, just sit down and think about that for a concept. You're still trying to hum and haw over what to write for NaNoWriMo this month? And you need a, like a really good topic to write that <laughs> little over 10,000 <laughs> words a day to make it? Less Here's the premise. <laughs> a guy, engineer, like a student at the, the university and the mayor. He somehow manages to get enough people to vote for him, and so he's he's doing the school thing and doing the mayoral <laughs> thing. 
I think it'd be more funny if he's a high school student. Well, maybe it works. Yeah, it's like a, he's just like one of the super grads, so he, he meets the age requirements, yeah. and he's uh, still finishing grade twelve for the third year, sort of thing. But somehow manages to do something that gets enough people to vote for him. That uh, or or she, you know, because hey, you know, it doesn't have to be he. I'm just using he because of the guy I'm referencing who was okay. doing it. Gets in, becomes mayor, and it's high school mayor. <laughs> yeah. Come on, I mean, like, can, can you not think of some fun stuff to write about for that? I think that <laughs> uh, uh, just a, such an odd premise, and yet still logically constructed to make it actually, you know, like fit under the the, the registrations and, and 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 legal terms and all that. Uh, that could really help you get to that ten thousand, uh, you know, words a day limit you're going to have to face if you want to get it done by the end of the month. <laughs> well, yeah, another good idea from the from us good folks at the simulation. It's we can't call ourselves the House of Ideas because <laughs> Marvel stolen that like forty years ago. Yeah, are we a house? Uh, we live. We both live in apartments. So. The apartment of ideas. The apartment. Of ideas. <laughs> I don't know. That kind of sounds like the ideas are for rent, and you forget to pay enough money, you lose your ideas. Hmm. The uh, the fountain, the, the font of the, ideas. The open commune, the free living open commune of ideas. I don't know. You put commune in, and then we all send more pinkos in some people's eyes. Well, it, you're saying that we. We want ideas to be free. Yeah. So in case it'll be like a font, you know, like a fountain okay. sort of thing. The font of ideas? Yeah, the font of taken? ideas. That might be taken already. Font of ideas? Idea font. Idea fountain. We are the free-flowing pen of ideas. The pen of ideas. The 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 podcast of ideas? That's probably... The unlimited number of monkeys of ideas. <laughs> Eventually we'll come up with something good enough to put out there for you guys to pick up. Although it might take a while for us to get uh, a Shakespeare-based idea. Hmm. I mean, we're only two guys simulating so many, you know, random monkeys out of typewriter. I mean, you got to set your sights a little lower there, buddy. We're giving out the ideas for free, too, so you know, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay, so yes. <laughs> let's try once again to segue, or into what seg, as you doing, like to yeah. say. Uh, <laughs> to slide into into the next uh, base that is oh, our, uh, our baseball diamond of, of plot points. Uh, so yeah, do you want to go first uh, this week? Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. The simulations. Um, well, let's see some Minecraft. <gasps> Minecraft. Fucker. Um, what I did in Minecraft. Well, I mean, I've been hanging, having fun with uh, hanging out with different people on the Rock Block server, so that's kind of cool. Um, Have you gotten <laughs> rock blocked yet? Has someone stopped you from uh, actually using rocks? Have hmm. you been rock blocked? Good question. Or did the blocks truly rock you? I mean, there are limitations like you're not su- like they have a little couple little rules not too major but you're not supposed to build like a base or mine within 200 blocks of spawn I think it says something like that but you can yeah that is fairly common some places yeah. will even set aside like a you can't touch this zone the only way yeah. you could possibly modify anything is by setting a fire right outside and hoping that the trees catch fire so they burn their way towards the center. Uh, I won't admit to having done that on a previous server that I was maybe once a member of. <laughs> uh, it happens. Um, no. Uh, so Do they have any rules about building over top of someone else? Like, uh, I will just build a staircase up to the top, and then I will just create a giant, you know, like like platform of death. Where everything is in the dark for everyone else. Oh boy, yeah. Good thing you're not on the server. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's why I purposefully uh, make sure I'm very careful about what servers I'm on, and I usually focus myself on the Skyblock sort of personal server. Uh, no, I don't think there's a rule against that. I think it. <laughs> however, I think uh, it would fall under griefing probably if you. Uh, um, <laughs> it would. I mean, if if you like, I'm hoping to. I'm still kind of getting to know the people on the server, so you know, I kind of get to recognize them as they come on and play a little bit more. But if you get to know people a little bit better and you kind of have a joking relationship with them and they know that, you know, if you prank them, like, there's a difference between a grief and a prank, right? Yeah. Grief is like, you know, I guess you don't take it down after or, you know, it's not just a joke. Well, the prank sort of thing, you know, it would be like you build it out of wooden blocks that way when all's said and done, you just light it on fire and it all burns away. Yeah. Whereas griefing is uh, obsidian. And lava falls coming down on in random spot. Yeah, and if you like destroy something that they've built, so that they have to build it all over again or something like that. I have seen some mighty fine statues of uh, like players in various poses done out of uh, wool. So a single like 
flint, you know, strike can completely demolish everything. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah. there's only so many <laughs> colored blocks you can work with, and I find that's a bit of a, a shame and a limitation in the game right now. Hmm. You know, you're not. It's not enough to have clay and wool and glass and. Clay's uh, still hard enough for me to find right now, oh, as yeah. well as glass uh, tinting and all that sort of thing. Um, plus, if you tint it out of glass, then it looks kind of weird from a, a bit of a distance. I've found as I've, I've tested stuff out. Yeah, it doesn't have that solid stuff to it. It looks kind of like a. Oh, mind you, you want to go for a nice little haze, and this is like, what is that in the distance? And as it comes closer, it gets get a little bit more defined. That's interesting. Yeah, because I I am also not the biggest fan of the colored glass. Just. It's okay. That and glass is a limited resource. <laughs> Wool is technically infinite in that it keeps growing. Yeah, and so long as you can get the uh, iron from like an iron golem farm, which uh, so I've learned is very easy to farm for with a bucket of lava and some uh, dirt. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> um, it is completely infinite. Although if you really want to get technical and not cheaty, you could still like raise and grow the sheep and then slaughter them one at a time for a less efficient uh, harvesting method. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and now... It gets you mutton now, so I guess it's the, a food yeah, resource. Yeah, version, there's mutton. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I've been playing on server, and I've, I've arranged some chests, and I've been sort of calculating out, like, I want to start a shop, right? I want to ah, start a shop on the server. And, and be like, so I was thinking it would be uh, Prospector Space Boots Rock and Gem Shop. Hmm. So I would sell rock, anything that's stone or mineral or gems, up to including diamonds, and even I don't have any nether stars, but even up to the. You know, so stars. so would it have a uh, like does the uh, the server have a system set up whereby such trades take place properly and automatically, or would it just be like uh, here are these chests? If you want, I, I suggest you put in like this much return. Yeah, it's it's just vanilla, so there's no um, plug-in that I, no. I have played on servers where it's just a, pl- it, a plug-in handles the trades. So yes. Yeah, but it's not that. It's this one is just vanilla. Deeply uh, ingrained in the honor mm-hmm. system, which yeah, I think so is nice. Uh, yeah, and the server that I'm on currently, they they say that they've had problems with people stealing and griefing, and personally, like. Like, I was like, oh, well, how would I feel if somebody stole or griefed from me? I'm not that worried about it. Like, I, I enjoy starting over. I enjoy collecting the resources. So I figure if mm. I lose some things, I mean, I might say, well, hey, you guys w- might want to watch this person because, I don't know, cause mm. other people can't take it as well. But as far as me going, like, I would rather have that person as a friend and, like, keep them on the server. Mm. Um I mean, unless, unless they're doing a po- total troll, but I haven't. Yeah. That's something that I haven't really experienced in Minecraft too much. I am thankful to say I haven't experienced that much either for that end of things. Uh, and you are talking to a guy that has like flattened an entire desert island, or at least the eastern half of a desert island, just to make things look better. And I like, like, what am I going to do today? I guess I'll just uh, collect a lot of sand, <laughs> a whole lot of sand. Oh my goodness. So, yeah, so I guess I've been doing a lot of accounting in Minecraft because I've been trying to calculate, not exactly calculate, but sort of just feel out. like Figure out some would, ratios. Yeah, like, and I'm basically, everything is priced in gold nuggets. Ah. And, and some other people in the server started that, and I was like, okay, that works because nine gold nuggets is a gold bar, and nine gold bars is a gold block. Yeah. So you can scale it fairly easily. Mm. So if you just price everything in gold nuggets, then... And you can convert it very easily. Although it is a little annoying that it's not a base 10 system. Yeah, I like it, though. I like it because it's quirky. Mm. <laughs> so um, That's okay. It helps you with programming. And, you know, like, like one kilobyte is not 1,000 bytes. It's 1,024 based on the base 8 system sort of thing. Yeah. Weirdness like that. Yeah, so so the next step is to actually build a physical shop and, like, put the, the chest down, put a little sign on every chest to see, like, you know, this rock I will sell for so-and-so, this rock I will buy for so-and-so. And, uh, yeah, I think it'll be good. Mm. So uh, how, how how stylish are you planning on making your shop? Is it going to be, like, just pure utilitarian? Are you going to make something that's, like, uh, got, like, ah, over here we have the gemstone, you know, like, uh, you know, department in, in this one room. Over here we've got the basic stones, and over here we've got the more exotic materials. Hmm, I was going to do it basically just one big room, and with the relatively, like, some good blocks as floors, like, possibly obsidian, like, something kind of... Mm. A little bit I have had some looking. very nice uh, visual designs in doing a uh, like a cross pattern 
with um, it'd be sandstone and uh, blocks of um, oh, sorry peasant stone for the uh, the, uh, the the emeralds. Uh, Let's see. A sense, oh. em- the emerald blocks you get oh, from em- uh, the trading. Oh yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I can event cause with my towns, I get enough trading in that eventually all these gems. Oh, I'll just you know turn all these emeralds into blocks, mm-hmm. and it's a very nice uh, light visual design for it. I like that thought. Yeah, I don't have like in my uh, on the server like in my single player world, I have lots of emeralds. I have access to villagers with all the trades open. But I haven't done a lot of trading or got my own villagers in this on the server yet, so maybe. Well, in that case, you might want to go with sandstone and uh, and the obsidian for the black and white checkerboard style. And that'd be, I think that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Or you could just get yourself some sheep, make them whatever color you want, and just put down some carpet on the place. It would be kind of neat too to like do like a glass counter. You know how like jewelry shops have the. Glass? Oh yes, yes. I'm nice not sure that. how you'd manage that in Minecraft with. I, I guess you can fit item frames behind a glass pane, technically. Mm. So maybe I'll do that way, something like that. Experiment. Uh, start up like you know like a small little uh, you know cheaty based you know personal server and just try out some <laughs> visual designs yeah. as you go. I have saved myself so much hassle by going into you know like a, like an open world creative mode style and just playing around until I find something I like and then recreating it in the real world, well, the the real server I play on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, so that's Minecraft, and I wanted to mention like because I have been working on a, a video game. Did it, like last night, spent a lot of time working on uh, my Matter Miner game, which is currently called Matter Miner. It's Imagine a, a stellar system with no p- true planets, but just one asteroid belt ring. Now imagine being able to dig out as much of it as you want. It's like <laughs> like the War Fortress. Or Minecraft in space. Yeah, except, of, of course, yeah, most of the time you're not in space, you're inside an asteroid, like, flying through tunnels. But with a small amount of so, gravity, effectively, on there, it can yeah. be, could be just like a non-spacey space. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah. Or I guess uh, you could think of it as something like uh, sci-fi space, because they have such a horrible sense of, like, how far away planets and stuff are. Yeah, yeah. It's like fantasy space. <laughs> well, I remember one thing like uh, the Twilight Zone was like, oh my goodness, you're like a, a hundred million miles away from the sun. You are completely lost. I'm like, like, no, no, that's like two-thirds of the way from the sun to Earth. Like, how can you not figure out how far away you are? Like, what, what the heck's going on there? Yeah, Earth is 93 million miles from the... 93 million is one Or the million. kilometer thing like that. It's this very, it's like, you know, they give all these huge, huge numbers and think it's like, oh my goodness, you are so lost from the, the, the star you're about to be around. It's just another, you know, blip in the night sky. And it's like, no. No, that's about the same as our sun. <laughs> you're going to see us, an actual sun out there, not like complete night sky all the time. It's like, you guys didn't do your research at all. Yeah, nothing, nothing. well, and and as far as video game goes, that's just fine, because <laughs> I think it might get a little tedious if you're, okay, nine months of travel to the next asteroid. <laughs> that just means every asteroid you, you land on, you make the most of it that's before true. you go to the next. Yeah. It's the ultimate desert bus. Have you, like, I think I have right played, uh, or at least seen desert <laughs> bus be, be played. It's, uh, it's an interesting game. Um that said, if you're doing yours, I kind of hope you have, like, uh, like, just say, oh, yeah, you've got a computer on board that'll do the angles and all the other stuff, right? So you, you blast off from one, and you go to the other as need be. Yeah. Well, Desert Bus, it, like, pulls a little to the left. Yes, the bus <laughs> leads to the left, so you can't just let it go straight. You have to I love it. tap it. But tap imagine, it. like, Mars Bus. <laughs> Desert Bus, but it's nine months. Or is, is Mars nine months? I think it's... I guess um, that's the fastest, maybe. It's like two years. Fast as possible. Normal things for people right now is about a two-year. Yes, yeah. If you had direction. humans on board, it'd be, you can't accelerate as fast. Though they are always working on different uh, spatial, uh, you know, like uh, transportation methods, and there is one that is potentially uh, able to get us there in about uh, six months or less, which would really open up the, you know, uh, our neighboring planets. Yeah, and Mars and Expressway. It, well, it's, it's it makes it a lot easier because uh, the big problem with going out to another planet or in these days is that uh, when you're out there, you are out there. Like, um, if you're okay, you're on Mars, you got everything down there, and uh, oh no, this microchip is broken. Uh, how are you going to get a replacement? Well, that's 
a two year like order wait and let's hope that wasn't on something very important <laughs> Uh, yeah. We are making very good strides with the use of 3D printers and, you know, printing what you want. So it won't be like, you're like, oh, no, there goes my last glove. Now, you know, like, we're all going to have to be in, you know, one-handed space suits now. <laughs> um, your hand's going to have to come off. <laughs> no, no, you just got to tuck it in next to your, you, oh, you know, okay. your, your waist as you go in there. We're just going to, you know, plug up that bit, you know, for the, the right arm. And, oh, hope you're left-handed, buddy. Otherwise, this is going to get really awkward. Although, if you, if you were running out of things to, like, you... Uh, variety in your diet, you know, you could add a hand to your your diet. Yeah, but do you really gain that much out of eating your own body parts? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. Well, at least you know you're not going to catch any weird, you know, crazy cannibal diseases that way. Because if you did, you already had it, so no worries. Well, although, like, um, uh, well, I think it prion disease comes from eating brains. It is. If I you eat your own brain, you've got some other problems going on first. But <laughs> it doesn't matter because you're not going to care. You ate your own brain. You, you tend to, to lose a sight on a lot of stuff. Although, that would be a nice scene for like a, like a zombie movie. I want to see the zombie eat its own brain. <laughs> ah, crack its own head open, you know, sort of thing. You know, like a, uh, you know, like a, some sort of like trying to get into the mall and also the brain is exposed and the old oh, zombie's eating its own brains. <laughs> It's more fun that way. I, I think there are aspects of your, like, your body that you, like, you're not supposed to transfer bacteria from one part to the other. That can be dangerous. Well, it's the digestive system. Uh, on the, When it comes to surface-based stuff, various parts of your body act as different biomes. You are your own world. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, the bacteria on your derriere is not the same as the bacteria at the back of your neck. Not the same as the bacteria on your feet. Although you can make an argument that the bacteria in your feet kind of come from everything else. Every time you go in the shower, it kind of all washes down a little. Hmm. Um, but no, it's, uh, each each region of your, your body, your armpits are like swamps, you know, your forehead's a desert, whatever. Um, but that's not going to wind up really hurting you. They are, by and large, for the purposes of, of you, um, mm-hmm. inoffensive, you know, creatures. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very yeah. benign. Although, like, that's where we get food poisoning, too, though, also, sometimes, is from people mm-hmm. not washing their hands uh, and getting bacteria from one part of the body uh, into food or into... In which case, that's from the digestive system, usually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, wash your hands after using the bathroom, <laughs> you sicko. <laughs> Seriously, that's the worst part about and the people who get the disease, is they know that someone didn't wash their hands. They ate mm-hmm. butt food. <laughs> Oh my! <laughs> I know. Think about that next time you hear somebody like, "Oh, I must eat something bad at a restaurant." It wasn't agreeing with me. They ate butt food at the restaurant, and they paid for it. Hmm. They paid money for it. It's not even like like I didn't properly cook enough that chicken when I was making it for myself. It's like, no, okay, that's that's kind of inexcusable. Chicken's a little difficult for a new uh, cooker, you know, sort of thing. You're getting off there. It's a nice, uh, you know, leap forward. You get a chicken cooked properly, it opens up for all sorts of nice dishes you can make for yourself. Uh, but you improperly cook the chicken, you get salmonella. You get a little, oh no, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been poisoned myself. But it's not like it came from the inside of somebody's body. You know, it was from a, you know, like a chicken. <laughs> so, uh, what have you been up to, simulation-wise? Uh, aside from creeping people out with the realization of like <laughs> what they got sick from, um, I actually haven't been on Minecraft at all this week okay. because I was finishing up a mod for Dwarf Fortress. Ah, oh, yes, more Dwarf Fortress. Yeah. Um, I was, uh, I had a lot of stuff noted down and some nice ideas, but I had to fix this problem up, work on this, finish that up, and then bring everything up to the new code because mine was all written for version 36 from the 2012 release. It's now 2014, almost 2015. Um, mm-hmm. And it's version 40. 40.16, as it currently stands, I believe. Uh-huh. Got everything up to code. It was a nice theme-based one. Uh, very easy. Nothing. Some mods go really in-depth. Mine was just like, here's a bunch of monsters, uh, and, uh, you know, like uh, like grasses and, and trees and stuff to use for cold biomes. Because mm-hmm. I had made a fortress before in cold biomes. I started on, like, a, a horrible haunted glacier. And you know what? Occasionally I get attacked by Blizzard Man or evil, you know, like like Hell Wolves sort of thing, you know. And it's like, that's not bad, but eventually I just got swarms. And like, uh, how it works is uh, like a, 
monster will or your creature will randomly appear on the map sort of thing you know coming off from you know off map and they'll wander in and they'll go about and they'll leave out another area and uh, sometime later another creature comes in so if you want to stop so many creatures from coming in randomly you try and capture them and keep them stored somewhere else so that uh, no creature no you can't have a new creature come in the old creature still hasn't left and I was getting so tired of muskox and uh, and reindeer on, on just coming on the map, acting like they own the place, attacking new migrants. Although there was one migrant that got really upset at a deer, bit its nose off and spit it out, and it kept on walking. So big old, you know, like uh, Rudolph the Bloody Red Nose reindeer. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I had fun imagining that, but I, I got tired of the lack of variety. So I decided, you know what, no, I, I can create some other creatures. There's no mastodons in the game. Hmm. And so I basically took an elephant. Uh, mastodons aren't as big as elephants, so I shrunk it by uh, 25%. Gave it some nice, uh, you know, thick uh, wool. Uh, well, nice thick, you know, it's fur, but it's so thick it's woolly, you know, all that. And you can, you could capture the, the mastodons, and then you could tame them, and then you could, like, shear the wool regularly and have mastodon wool robes for all your dwarves. Oh, that's that's awesome. Not potentially as awesome as the uh, the woolly boars I created, because they're much smaller, they also provide ivory, and their meat tastes like pork. Not that it actually matters in the game, but, you know, it's like, ooh, pork, everyone loves pork. Mm-hmm. So it's, it gives you wool, it gives you ivory, and it gives you meat. And it's uh, not a grazer. So a, this was like an ideal creature sort of thing. It gets you a lot of good resources. And as with any creature with a skeleton, it gets you bones mm-hmm. and uh, skulls. So you can decorate up skulls and sell, you know, like boar skulls to, you know, the traders. I like that thought. I like the thought that, um, you know how, like, scientists are talking about, like, oh, maybe we could bring back the woolly mammoth or something like that. All I needed <laughs> to do was find an elephant code, adjust it partially, add some wool, and then... Uh, check it in the arena just to make certain I was doing everything right. Everything went right, so, you know, hey, I'm done. And so I arena tested everything. Not everything is 100% perfect. My jolly snowmen still aren't working right. Um, I've got them so that they have a nose proper. um, But it won't... carrot nose? Well, that's the thing is is I want it to always be the color orange, but for some reason it wasn't accepting or using the the description for, like, a color for the nose. Okay. or the eyes, which is a shame, because I was looking through all the various colors that Dwarf Fortress recognizes, and, oh, hey, one of the colors is charcoal. So I could have always had it go like the, you know, the Jolly Snowman, you know, it's just, it's just a moving snowman, what do you expect? Its eyes are charcoal, in which case oh, yeah. it wouldn't actually be a piece of charcoal, it's just the color, but it, it works yeah. out nicely. And that's not accepting it, and I was like, well, I haven't figured it out, I must be missing something very basic to have it not register right. Um, other than that, it's... Uh, it's not dropping a silk hat upon death. Because, you know, like Frosty the Snowman, there must have been some magic in that old silk hat they found. Mm-hmm. So I want it to be like a, you kill or like, a, you know, the, the Jolly Snowman dies <laughs> and it leaves behind a corpse item, which is a master quality silk hat. Mm. But it's not doing that, possibly because it doesn't... I don't know why it's not accepting the entity for... or the, the token for a cap. And I don't know if it's not accepting the token for the spider silk I wanted to use, but it's just not working right. And I have I, I, the code's out there now. I've, I've put it up on the forums. Oh yes, an true. Arctic edition, as I call it. <laughs> um, so hopefully someone will like say, "Oh hey, you forgot to put in this and this one word." Because I mean, I had a huge problem with uh, snowman uh, earlier before. It's like uh, like whenever they were melting, because I had it so that any temperature above zero and they would technically start to burn until they melted away and whenever they melted and all that it was like uh, some sort of unknown fluid and I'm like like, well what's up with that and it turns out I was missing five letters and a colon that's all I needed to do to fix the problem oh. I just had to find the right area mm-hmm. um, spoiler alert my, uh, my snowmen aren't actually made out of snow I think uh, you mentioned this yeah. last time yeah yeah <laughs> water doesn't uh, evaporate so I found like uh, 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 um, something that does evaporate, which turns out to be tears. Yeah, yeah. Although I'm thinking now that it's all effectively done and it's mostly working, I'll make it. Uh, I'll make an equivalency for instead of like a good, you know, glacier, an evil glacier, and it'll be made mm. out of blood, and it'll be a sinister snowman. Oh, cool. <laughs> the blood snowman. Yeah, it'll just be made out of blood. Could you have a yellow snowman? 
Yes, yes, I could. All I have to do is declare like the item and and change it to, to a thing. Uh, although I have been thinking about creating like because uh, you can create your own like uh, like product tags and all that sort of thing. It's like use the tier template, mm-hmm. and I, you can make your own templates for this sort of thing. And so I was thinking of filth yellow and filth brown because I do have winged monkeys that I would love to have like a filth throwing attack <laughs> where they actually fling their their filth at you. Uh, yeah. It wouldn't be a very strong attack, but it would be very disgusting. <laughs> and I could even attach a contact syndrome to it so that uh uh whenever you get it so I could simulate like some sort of ah filthy disease on you. Ew. Mm. In which case they could be rather annoying. So in addition to them flying over your stuff and stealing your goods, they also fling their filth at you and make you sick. <coughs> and so, you know, that, but that's not an Arctic-themed one, so I'm focusing on other stuff. But uh, as of the last time I checked, over 100 people had viewed my mod, and a couple people seemed very enthused. Oh, cool. Uh, I was like, oh boy, now I want to try and, like, an Arctic embark, because before, I mean, aside from the threat of just starving to death before you get anywhere good... Because if you're on a glacier, there's ice. You can't start a farm immediately. Right. You have to dig down, find the caverns, wall off some stuff so make sure nobody attacks you, and move everything down before everything starts freezing. Because uh, in World Gen, if you, you can set up some like advanced parameters. You can make it so cold, uh, dwarves will last a couple minutes above the, the ground, and like wood just explodes from the cold. It's so cold there. So, yeah, it, it does hurt. On the other hand, some of the creatures I made worked the other way. For a long time, I was wondering, like, my blizzard harpies, they summon the Arctic storms. But there might be something wrong with it, because I'm looking at them, and, uh, you know, after the, they attack each other, and this one is, like, burnt everywhere. Why is it burning? Is it, like, something to do with, like, the, the powers that flows past them? Because they were able to summon up, like, as it's just water, and so, it, you know, as a powder. And so that's when I realized, after the one corpse disappeared, it's like, oh... That's right. Anything above zero, which the arena testing map is, um, they're they're like burning from the heat of this this calm day. Hmm. It's in sub zero temperatures that they thrive and do well. Okay. So it's like, oh, haha! I outclevered myself that way. <laughs> but it looks like somebody might wind up uh, using uh, the mod stuff I, I did for a group succession fortress in the uh, the forums. Ooh, cool. So, hopefully, you know, if there's any problems, it'll get, like, tested out. Yeah. But, uh, like, I've, I've taken a look at some what other people have done in there, and so it's like, oh, this guy's come up with dwarf trees. You know, nice little trees for mountainous and cold areas, as okay. you see, because yeah, of the yeah. cold. And it's like, ooh, I'm going to ask him, like, you mind if I roll that in with mine? And somebody came up with an ice lizard that uh, apparently you can, like, it can bite you and, like, cause, you know, frost burn. It's a syndrome that mimics it. Effectively, it uh, causes some limited necrosis and a potential like uh, rotting of the brain to simulate the cold. Mm-hmm. Um, your cre- your dwarves can get down to really, really cold temperatures everywhere on their body, but it doesn't seem to affect them unless it hits their brain. Hmm. So, as so long as their brain is warm, the dwarf will keep trudging on, but hmm. as soon as the brain freezes, they go dead. Hmm. Which might be explained why they keep drinking alcohol is to keep the brain safe at sub-zero temperatures. Maybe. Maybe. Alcohol is as an antifreeze? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure. Bio-antifreeze. Yeah. But there's some other stuff I want to wind up doing, too. I, mm-hmm. I noticed as I was looking through the material definition tags, there's plant-based alcohol, like for making, you know, like, like beer out of wheat, but there's also an animal-based alcohol. So I might want to mess around with cows and come up with a, like a, some sort of like a species that you milk for booze. Beef gahal? <laughs> I'm going to have to sit down and think about this. Like, what animal truly <laughs> represents intoxication? It might be pig from, you know, eating, like, the, the, the windfall apples. Mm, yeah, yeah. Or maybe just something creepy, like a large rat you milk for decent amounts of alcohol. <laughs> just to make it creepy. Because, I mean, dwarven, dwarven cheese in the game is, is gotten by milking a maggot. So maybe we'll just create a giant subterranean maggot that, you know, like, lactates booze. Hmm. It's a thing. It could happen. Yeah, I'm trying to think of an animal that would that is associated with alcohol. Um, Maybe it'll just be like a giant, like a, like ectoplasmic blob sort of thing. Maybe that's how I do it. Maybe they're not even a natural tame species. Maybe you got to go down in the caverns. You got to find them. You got to domesticate them. 
Could you have like a plant monster, like a malt monster? Um, there is tags to make sure a creature qualifies as being uh, vegetation. Hmm. But I think for all intents and purposes, they're otherwise just a normal animal. So you could have a malt mon- So you could have a malt monster. Yes, they do have lava men and blood men. I could make a malt man. Mm-hmm. Um, they are their uh, dwarf fortresses equivalent of uh, like elementals. Like they have a fire man instead of like a fire elemental. Okay. Yeah. So I could make like the booze mental, <laughs> which is a booze man. Yeah. Except that when it dies, it would just leave a bunch of booze spilled on the floor, which is... That's kind of sad. Yeah. On the other hand, if you could, like, capture a booze thing and then milk it, like, domesticate it and milk it, <laughs> I mean, that sounds dwarvy and creepy, and I think that might wind up being the way to go. But there is some other stuff I want to do for the the, the uh, Arctic mod I made up. Like, um, I made lemmings. And as anyone who's read the Wikipedia or actually looked at Lemmings knows, they don't go about committing suicide. That was a Disney thing in the 50s that uh, they they faked a whole bunch of stuff for. And they got an award for it, and they've never officially apologized. Looking at you, Disney. Make yourself good. Say sorry about the bad documentary. Mm. That's all all I think anyone really asks, is to say, sorry that we made such a bad documentary, and we're really sorry we got an award for it. We're not giving back the award, uh, but we are officially apologizing. So that's, 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 you know, that sounds reasonable for something that happened a half century ago, right? Uh, I guess so. I mean, I, I'm i not... Yeah, I'm not burning up over Disney, but... Uh. Well, because of this, the concept of a lemming as a, uh, as a uh, creature that commits suicide, and, you know, it has led to the, ex, you know, like the, the phrase, you're all a bunch of lemmings, as someone who's willing to fall someone else to the point of death. Okay, but um, has it really harmed lemmings? Do people, like... <laughs> people Hunt still lemmings believe lemmings. Oh, they're just gonna commit suicide anyways. I'll people still kill make like the bad jokes about it. like Garfield. You know, like oh, you know, like uh, oh, you're a weird little mouse. Oh, I'm half lemming, and you know, it's like he throws himself off the side of the the table, <laughs> or Garfield finds him face down in the water dish. I'm communing with my lemming heritage, and it's just, it's created some bad Garfield jokes. Shame on you, Disney. Okay, well that's reason enough, I suppose. Um, but I created lemmings, and then I was thinking like. Like I could create like a like cross combine them with the kobolds in the game and create like a race of creatures that just come up and, and just suicide themselves up against the dwarven <laughs> fortress. So like uh Lembolds Like the lemmings from the video game. Yes, yes, which exists because of the uh the thought that lemmings or people will just walk right off a cliff unless you prevent them otherwise. So I'll have to go back and see if I can find the proper coding for a creature that effectively detonates upon getting too injured. Um, and see if I can create that. So it'd be like, oh no, the I don't even know what to probably call call them. Like kobold lemmings, clemmings. Hmm. Yeah, clemmings is not bad. So I'll, I'll just call them clems for Clemptings. now. Clemptings, lembolds, <laughs> or maybe just find like some other name for lemming that sounds kind of like kobold and just go with that. But uh, I could create a race of them, you know, just, you know, like, oh, no, they're attacking, and then the dwarves attack, you know, hit them, and then boom, oh, hi, kind of, you know, detonate itself. What a lemming maneuver of it, ha-ha. Hmm. Just a nice little extra creature to to, to have. Uh, and as well, uh, I've had some fun with interactions, uh, in, like uh, creating creatures that summon the Arctic storms, like my blizzard oh. harpy can do. Uh-huh. And, uh, and so I was like, what if I created a creature that could do that pretty much any time it wanted? Like, uh, like uh, the recharge refresh rate for that ability was almost instantaneous. Then I make it just a small little thing, very hard to hit, give it some uh, like a real good natural skill in dodging, and uh, so maybe some damage resistance too, because you can do that in the later versions of the game now. Okay. Um, so I can make it like rather hard to hit and damage. Um, but it could be the heart of the storm, and it summons like a, effectively it's a, like a giant Arctic storm that blows around itself constantly. Hmm. So I could have like a sentient storm, and that works out like once I get that done, I could create equivalencies all down the line for other areas. I could have like a, a typhoon, the heart of a typhoon. I could have a lightning storm, in which case it could do like an interaction where it smacks you with lightning, and all of a sudden you get a lot of shock and pain, some numbness. And all that fun stuff. So it, it could be some very nice semi mega beasts, mm-hmm. uh, about on par with, I suppose, a giant. It causes some decent problems, but not completely. Oh, like ah, oh, god, everyone shut everything down and run, you know, go run and hide, and hopefully it'll just like, like destroy itself. So 
I'm thinking it's got some nice potential there, and if I get it coded up quickly enough, I can get it put in into uh, what I put in for you know on the forums before anyone starts a succession game, and I'll get to see how well it Oops. translates out to when uh, the dwarves of you know the, the Arctic fortress get attacked by a sentient blizzard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. So I knew, yeah, and if nothing else, I'm just going to wind up enjoying what it's like to create it. Like, like, like how many pieces should a blizzard have for a living blizzard? Um, I do recall some creatures, like a, like a like a Balrog, that actually had layers of shadows around it, and you'd hack off the shadows before you could really get into the nice, juicy, tender internal parts. So I might do that with like a wind force stuff, and then something use a something that uh, evaporates quickly so you don't like you know left over with some weird wind laying on the ground like what's up with that it's just like a chunk of wind laying on the ground weird hmm. so I'll have to think down and explore in my own mind how to how to work this sort of thing sure yeah and maybe maybe give it a nice reward like a high end uh, like gem upon death you know it's like ah the heart yeah. of the storm cool. with a for a blizzard is a clear diamond enjoy I like that yeah, yeah. So you know, I'll, I'll I'll have some fun if nothing else, exploring it in my mind. If it doesn't work out as a creature, it doesn't work out as a creature. But at least I had the thought. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, I I try to 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 work it out. And that's half of why I code in the first place for Dwarf Fortress. I have an idea. How would this work? Oh, it works, and it's easy to work. I'll make it. Mm-hmm. Huzzah! So that's been my big thing this week, and uh, I've rather enjoyed that I got positive response. Even if no one's come up, uh, at least uh, as the last time I looked, with a solution for my jolly snowmen and why they're not doing what I want them to. Yeah. Right. But I, I don't suppose the game will break if you don't get enough silk hats upon killing snowmen. <laughs> Such is life, I suppose. All right. Cool. Oh, yes. The snowmen are effectively made out of a snow-like material, so I've tried them in fights. They just get demolished by anything. Mm-hmm. They're as easy to destroy as hitting a snowman. <laughs> like, like Which would be somewhat satisfying. Uh, well, it depends on the nature of the dwarves in the fortress sort of thing. Say, ah, you know, like, we'll put them out here and they'll be, like, in a nice little area where we can watch them play and, and rollick around. Or it's like, ah, snowmen, I shall capture you and I shall let you loose down near the magma pools at the base and I shall watch you melt. Ha <laughs> ha! Whatever way they want to go, they're all okay with that. Right. But they only appear on good aligned glaciers. So, uh, it'll be, because it, uh, right now, if you're on an evil glacier, you get blizzard men and these arctic wolves that are really nasty and come after you. But if you f- find a rare occasion for a good aligned glacier, there's nothing different. This mm-hmm. time you get jolly snowmen coming up mm-hmm. and uh, different types of like arctic type fairies. So I say, like, ooh, look at it glisten and glow. Hooray. Woo. Yeah, I like that. That's a good Christmas uh, thing <laughs> leading into Christmas. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing I was thinking like I could try and create like a, a different type of food where it'd be like a dwarf mashes together two ingredients and comes up with a, like a dwarven candy cane. Hmm. Like this dwarven, uh, like this candy cane is created out of booze and fat. It is finely minced for both, and it is delicious. It is worth a hundred dwarf bucks. Sounds good to me. They've eaten more... In previous editions of the game, it was possible to create a, a roast out of nothing but liquids. How you were able to do that was never explained, but it would be finely minced booze, finely minced booze, finely minced booze, and finely minced wine. Mixed together to create a dwarven... Like, uh, you know, uh, I guess it'd be like a wine roast is what it'd be. Hmm. Delicious strawberry wine roast. Would you like some? Yeah, I'd eat that. But the weird thing was, I could could imagine it being semi-solid. Like, it was like like you turned it into some sort of like a jello product. And I don't know if I want to create like like, like an alcohol, like, you know, hey, I created jello shots. shots. Yeah, Yeah, it's like, ew. (laughs) But uh, right now, the... Food is just a placeholder. It takes like so many groups of food, minces them to various degrees to determine quality and adds them together. There will be better styles, more differences and, and changes later on when the programmer gets around it. There's a lot of things to get around to. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, one day his attention will focus on that and then we'll have amazing foods for everybody. Roasts and cookies and you know candy canes and all sorts of fun stuff. I think one day. Mm-hmm. Maybe next year, maybe 2020. We'll have to find out. 
Sure. Yeah. That, that was that was my big stuff this week. Other than that, uh, just a lot of playing with my daughter. Fun stuff. Fun little games without names that kids come up with. Mm-hmm. But uh, those are private yeah. and personal. <laughs> and I'll cherish them always. Well, okay. Uh, I'll let you make that call. All right. Uh, and so we sort of have a main topic. Today. Well, I guess it's just kind of like a continuation or a reversal of last <laughs> week's topic. Last week's topic where we were talking about uh, what it's like to work for the man and the advantages or disadvantages. But we came up with a concept after we were done, like uh, it really depends on what the man is. If the man is a brutal, like, like Sith Lord dictator, working for the man, even if you're a good aligned, is, is very different than working for like a benevolent king. The nice, yeah. jolly, Santa-like king that sits on the throne and has, like, a dozen daughters kidnapped by dragons, and you have to save my daughter. So princess. this week, asking what your country can do for you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, especially because, I mean, we were talking about elections earlier, and that's something you don't see in a lot of pseudo-medieval campaigns, is the concept of a democratic country. Yeah, in D&D, usually you have, basically, theocracies or or monarchies or empires. Sometimes republics, if, if you got something well-developed enough. And that Yeah, it doesn't seem to be a campaign event that there's an election, which I think would be really cool to have as just, a, you know, something that's going on. You know, uh, lots well, of... Well, the, the names parallel very well, because if you're creating a campaign, this one would be an election campaign. Yeah, right. <laughs> there would be a campaign. Yeah, and, the uh, only way you slaughter the goblin is in the polls. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and because D and D often like sometimes a dungeon master will throw in, oh, there's a festival going on in town, or oh, you know, it's uh, they're celebrating this deity or that deity or whatever. But yeah, another f- sort of festive atmosphere could be that there, oh, there's an election going on, and even like in theory, you, the player could be like, oh, an election, huh? Well. I have I've a, got a hundred thousand gold I could spare. Maybe I'll just buy my position in this place. Ha ha ha! Because I am apparently cruel and, and uh, like the kind of person who believes you can buy votes. Which maybe you can. I imagine in like in a town <laughs> where the townsfolk make a silver a day, uh, or something on average. I'll give you a gold if you vote for me. <laughs> or then again, you know, like forget that. You know how many uh, thugs you can hire for one gold? <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, look up the orange men sort of thing. There, there was a history of uh, voting intimidation. Yeah, throughout yeah history. that happens. Uh, do we want like now that we've we've sort of opened this Pandora's box? We've brought democracy into the world of D and D, sort of in you know in our imaginations here just now. Yeah. And we've said, okay, you know, what if D and D had elections? But now suddenly there's a lot of problems with it. <laughs> well, is it any really that that worse from like, oh, the king is dead? Both princes declare their uh, their desire to have the royal crown. Congratulations, you're now in the middle of a civil war. Mm, yeah, that happens too. Which, by the way, is one of the reasons I really do like the royal princes in the uh, the Commonwealth uh, these days. Uh, Prince uh, Harry, Prince... Because uh, they get along? Because <laughs> um, they do not seem like the kind of guys that were willing to cause fights or even, you know, assassinations to, you know, get closer to the throne, which, admittedly, given their ancestors, is not a very common <laughs> occurrence. Yeah, I like that character trait in a person, not assassinating other people. I'd, well, I'd say it, that's a positive their family quality. history almost seems like they'd be genetically <laughs> weeded towards that end. True, yes. <laughs> uh, whereas you, you, you Google them up sort of thing and, and you find instances like, oh, the phone got hacked of one and it's like, uh, turns out, you know, like uh, Prince William sent Prince Harry a thing where he pretends to, you know, like to, to be, you know, a female he went out with the previous week and it was something like, uh, I just think it was so nice to go out with you that one night, even though I really think gingers are horribly ugly people. I love you, you big fat ugly ginger. And that was basically what what he said on the the like the text, you know, leaving the like the phone message there. It was just you know, high pitched girly voice. I love you, you big fat ugly ginger. Oh my! <laughs> and, and, and that's the thing. It's just like in that case, it's like okay, princes. Maybe that's not exactly the most princely of things to do, but they really did sound like brothers. And so it's it's nice seeing them okay. able to be brothers because that way they're like <gasps> they're like real people. These these noble, they're not like figureheads or or celebrity people. They're like real people. I have brothers. I would make funny phone calls to my brothers if I thought you know like oh. My youngest brother went out on a date last night. I'll send a humorous message into his inbox. <laughs> Have you done that to either of your brothers? Um, no, no. Uh, but only because it never occurred to me beforehand. Oh, boy. The royals gave me the idea. It's not my fault. <laughs> blame, blame, blame William. Talk about again. a bad influence. 
<laughs> Bad Mis- role model. Mischievous influence, that's all. <laughs> So I, I'm rather happy with them being people and being brothers, and you know, just doing brotherly things. I recall one bit where they're talking, you know, and one guy's, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, he makes fun of the other guy for being the redhead, and the other guy goes <coughs> bald, bald, because you know, Prince William's got a bit of a thin spot up near the top there, as is the the habit of of the family. I mean, Prince Charles has got the same sort of thing going on there, but they very much sound like brothers, and so in which case, hey, that's like. The, the benevolent sort of ruler you kind of hope for in D and D, yeah, well, as opposed to like the the political machination guy or the evil despot. I mean, it's one thing to be nice to your brother, and definitely that doesn't always happen with princes. But it's another thing to be nice to the people. So, you know, but that's the thing is, is, how can you be nice to a complete stranger underneath you on the, like the the political scale? When you can't be nice to your own brother well, or family, it, the, the people who really depends. are like on your level and that close to you. Yeah, it depends what you have invested. Like, unless they're complete jerks, everyone in your family, and you, you, you're like the, the turned over leaf of, of the you know like the the white sheep of the family. In which case, a complete stranger is so much better off than any one of your freaking family. Just to, 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 ah, I hate them. Well, I can imagine not Laggers necessarily being terribly like angry at your family, but. There could be a situation where you're like you know, you're the prince or whatever, and and uh, you're sort of mad at your family, and so you're like, well, you know, you'll get you'll you'll be at arm's length or even at rivals or whatever spear length, <laughs> spear length. Um, crossbow yet, range. But yet you'll want to make a point about how you're actually a good person, mm. you know, because that can wear on you. Like if you're always you know fighting and always in conflict and stuff like. Am I really a horrible person? Well, let's see. Like, what? How do I react to somebody who I'm not sort of related to? As I well? will ask the person <laughs> impaled on this uh, this spike, <laughs> and if so that yeah. fails, I will ask any of the other thousand people I've got on spikes down here. And and that occasionally happens, like in sort of historical context, is that a, a prince or somebody in power will sort of appeal to the people and be like, "Well, yes, I'm hated by these other nobles, but I'm a man of the people." But that's people a, they, they hate me because I like you. They think you are. <laughs> They think you're spit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think you guys are actually, like, worth something. And, so, you know, and yeah. sometimes there's something to that, and sometimes it's just cynical, like, you know, trying to use... I shall the play people. them to gain more meat <laughs> shields for my army. Ha-ha. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, yeah, I don't know how elections come into all of this. <laughs> well, if you can convince the people that you're, like, a man of the... Per- you know, or a woman of the people sort of thing. Or, I don't know, like, whatever it is. Because, let's face it, D&D, there's more than two genders. Sometimes you get weird craziness things going on. So it's not just a man of the people or a wo- woman of the people. Sometimes you're a automaton of the people. Like a Modron? <laughs> yeah, yeah. In which case sort of thing, uh, you know, uh, if, if they're willing to believe that you have a connection to them, they'll vote for you. Yeah. I guess, and uh, there's another problem though with um, sort of that, the, the noble reaching out and saying, no, we're going to have elections this year, like by, by Paylor. <laughs> Gosh darn it. <laughs> But we're going to have elections, and then they, they find out, oh, the people actually don't love me. <laughs> In which case, you have, like, a half-and-half half system where you've got, like, the, the ruling nobles, but you've also got, like, the the minor house of um, the elected representatives, and they're the ones who write up the laws, and the king is the person who says, ah, yes, I think this law is good enough, and you sign it. And, uh, you know, if it turns out it's a popular enough law and you veto it, well, congratulations, that's your head in the guillotine. I like buddy. it. It's almost like a bicameral system of parliament. What a weird concept. <laughs> I wonder if that's happened in real life anywhere. With the House of Lords and a ho- House of Representatives? Nah. House of the Common Man. It's sort of House of Commons, maybe. Nah, it'll never take off. It's a pure fantasy thing. But uh, in which case, you can get the best out of both. So it's like, uh, okay, you didn't start off the game as a noble, so you're not part of the noble caste. And those are the people that are... This is like a, a system I've got set up in the campaign... Unless you marry in, you're probably not going to be able to get in. So if you want to remain a bachelor sort of thing... And if you marry in, you've got to watch for daggers coming at your back because people are not going to like that. Welcome to the level of intrigue of political <laughs> court stuff. But you still want a position of power, you can always get yourself into one of the exalted uh, house of elected commoners. Mm, yeah. Or as the, the nobles call it, the house of riffraff. <laughs> but they don't say that out loud, not very often. Well, they might, depending. <laughs> Sometimes they, they're openly contemptuous of them. Uh, but usually there, there's a, like a whole concept for like uh, you get in there and you have some sway, some power, mm-hmm. even if they don't like you. Otherwise, you're getting voted in to do nothing. 
your vote means nothing and the whole thing is a sham. Which yeah. is a good way of like finding, oh, congratulations, you're now officially a figurehead. You have no real power. Uh, the average person is uh, just not smart enough to realize they're voting in figureheads. Now, there are board games where you play, like I believe there's a president, it's like re- running for president, the board mm-hmm. game or something like that. Um, so there are slightly different mechanical ways that you can look at sort of if you're taking on the, the role, like role playing, as a character running for office, you do slightly different things. You're not just fighting monsters or, you know, looting treasure and stuff. But well, I mean, you know, if there's like, a, you know, like, oh my goodness, you know, a large cavern has opened up, you know, like just underneath the, the large city. He goes down, he slays, and he ah, showers gold out for everyone. Or oh, I guess it'd be like copper, all the money that rolling down, and <laughs> you know, like underneath the sewers falls down, and they're eventually copper for everyone. Right. And so that's uh, the people will see you as the kind of guy who's out to do that. That's the um, the good publicity gimmick. It's like a, the whole, you know, digging that shovel in for, you know, the unearthing of a new mall sort of thing going yeah. up here. Ha huh. Well, didn't we have, like, or not, uh, didn't the United States had uh, a famous, uh, had a general, Eisenhower, I think, did that, where there was, he was, like, a general in the army, and he, like, mm-hmm. did a lot of good things, and... That is, does seem to be a very a good historical president. way for getting into uh, positions of power. So you start off with the military... And you learn how the system works, and then once you are molded by the system and you know about the system, you wind up going for the high position of power, because that's where you know you can really make a difference. Yeah, I suppose George Washington was kind of that too, right? Because mm. he was a, I mean, he, wa- he was he sort was a, of a he noble... He was a rebel freedom fighter at one point. He started as sort of a noble farmer, not farm owner, right? A plantation owner. And then... Which know, might be an interesting topic for another day, so like you know, the sedentary like rural campaign. You're a, f- a bunch of farmers, and you got to protect yourselves against like the random encounters that happen everywhere in the D and D world. Yeah, and then yeah, and then he moved on to be a revolutionary, and then he became a general, and then after all of that, they elected him. They there so were some people who wanted to make him king. They call him a uh, revolutionary now, but I'm pretty certain that at the time he was a terrorist. Uh, think about it. Blow <laughs> your mind. Yeah, I, I think uh, by history is written by the winners. Yeah. You can bet if the uh, Revolutionary War had failed, you would have been seen as a terrorist. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, what's the the English had a civil war? And, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, what's his face? Oliver Cromwell. Yeah, he's not viewed very particularly. Yeah, it might be that you need sort of a an affluent population to to sustain a democracy. But extent. not too affluent. Otherwise, they buy the whole thing for themselves. Well, no, I mean, yeah. like, the affluent population, like, the average person. Smart enough and educated enough to figure things out. Yeah, so that... And also, that means that they're, they're getting by. They're surviving. So a little bit of extra money, you know, if it were a bribe or if it were this or that, it wouldn't necessarily sway them. So, mm. like... A single <laughs> gold for my vote? How <laughs> insulting. Who do you want me to vote for? I'll make sure to vote against. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in which case, you really got to up your, your game sort of thing. Yeah, it is, and if you have people s- sort of starving in the street, and you're like, okay, you know, everybody's going to get to vote, so all these people are, you know... Ah, but I'm a mid-level cleric. There's <laughs> no people starving in the street, for I can create feasts. Oh, ah. Okay. Well, he's got my vote. <laughs> and that's the other thing, too, is, is uh, the concept of theocracies in, you know, like the real world is never seen as a good thing. Because it's like, ah, you are subjecting your your type of views and moral alignment on everyone else. And we live in a subjective world where, you know, I mean, what is good for them might not be very good for everybody. Mm-hmm. But in D&D, you've got the objective alignment system, in which case, you know, if you have a theocracy of a good god, that's not a bad thing. In which case, you know, like, you can see, like, theocracies popping up because, yes... My clerics can feed the poor and occasionally bring the dead back to life. In so which case, technically, yeah. we do have a king, but he really owes us so much after that, you know, like, thrice uh, successful assassination attempt that didn't <laughs> stick. So you can have it either be an open theocracy or, like, the power behind the throne, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I like to throw in a few, a little shade of gray into my campaign world. So... I wouldn't necessarily say the gods are objectively good, but I would say they're generally speaking like you can expect good things from a good team. Which, by the way, is something to think about well, when you go back to the old Greyhawk stuff. 
Gygax apparently wasn't big on having like specific good deities. Evil deities, yeah, because that way you get the monsters coming up and you get your evil yeah. cults. But he wasn't big on having good deities, but the players really called for it. So he created two good gods. Um, Pelor and St. Cuthbert. Uh, as, as they like to say in the alignment system, violent good and lawful jerk. <laughs> And so it wound up being that the good gods were just as annoying and, you know, and uh, antagonistic as the less malevolent of the evil deities. Well, if you look around the internet for a little while and look for articles on Paylor, I believe there's a couple that make the case that he's for a hidden evil yeah, god. he's actually evil. That's just mm-hmm. a misinterpretation of his uh, violent good uh, initial mm-hmm. persona. Yeah. Uh, in which case, you see the violence as being an evil thing oh, behind the good disguise. Um, so uh, you could technically have like a very you know militaristic uh, you know uh, theocracy, causing a lot of chaos for the purpose of the greater uh, eventual good. On the other hand, y- y- this is like a campaign or world existing setting where you can have the angels come down on behalf of the god. Forget the pope of, of this of this religion. Pope mm-hmm. is usually like the high spot you, you're you're aiming for. You know, like in, in a religious theocracy. But I'm, I'm willing to bet that Pope Francis would very much bow down and you know and uh, go with whatever an angel says if the angels manifest and you know and are able to show that you know no it's not really Satan in, in disguise sort of thing right. So if they're truly an angelic and you know objectively good society, sh- should they still have voting or should you know? In which case, the, yeah, the voting uh, d- just just like you don't need it. We have you know divined who the best <laughs> ruler will be. Okay. And according to our divinations, it is this child here. We shall now raise them to be the uh, the monarch of this land, or I guess was it sub pope, demi pope, whatever you know, yeah, like, you know yeah. whatever term they're going to have for that. But I w- I do wonder if it's an intrinsic because I I think of voting as v- or sort of democracy in general, not just voting, but as I said before, there's a few other participatory mechanisms in democracy that citizens can take part in. But uh, among them being voting, and among them voting being sort of one of those things that's objectively good, and part of a good society is governing with the consent of the governed, uh, and that part of that is voting. So I would think... I think it's actually an interesting split on the lawful alignment. Yeah. Uh, in, in a lawful society, you do as you are told. And so in which so case... no voting? or Well, that's how it would seem. On the other hand, the concept of, of uh, voting for proper represented, you know, like power in election is very lawful. Yeah. It's everyone having one full unified voice, and that's very lawful. And so in which case it would seem pro-voting. So, like, whereas you can say in a chaotic, you know, alignment, you know, like a chaotic good government, it's very much voting uh, lacks, you know, like lacks or even non-existent sort of thing. The chaotic people would be sort of apathetic towards voting because they... Or at least, uh, you know, like, no, 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 I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I just want to, I know I'm doing good. I just want to keep on doing this good. And so you might uh, have... Like, if anyone's in power, it's not really very big. You know, if you, you want a new road system going from here to there, you get a bunch of people that think it's a good idea, you get them to contribute to someone building the road, in which case the government's not even involved. It's just, you know, like, the will of the people manifesting whenever need be. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Whereas in the lawful one, you have, like, you can have a very good argument for and against voting, especially in a and d type thing. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> that's a little weird, man. Where does it go? In which case, maybe you know, voting for the, the like the will of the people becoming one is a, a neutral uh, type thing for the uh, the law and order axis. Yeah, it, probably it is the combined chaos of everyone speaking into one unified voice. In which case, voting is a mid ground between it. Yeah, and I would put it like as far as good and evil goes, I would put it on voting on the side of goods or yeah, slightly. It's not necessary yeah. to be good. But I would say it's more good than evil. I, I put it would not be with evil. the same way the, the moral axis has uh, usually gone for neutral. Uh-huh. Um, you would rather prefer having good neighbors than evil neighbors, but you're neutral and uh, you'll try and make do with whoever you know sets up you know shop next to you. So in which case, uh, voting is the same way. You would much rather have the good guy in power than you know like the, the evil you know like uh, Sir Dickweed the Fourth. <laughs> Which, by the way, is an actual plant name. Haha. <laughs> um, but in the end, it winds up being lawful because 
you can subvert, I mean, as you've been able to see in real world examples, horribly subvert the, the election purity processes. You mm-hmm. can try and get more people of, of one group to vote than the others. You yeah. can try and physically intimidate some people away from voting. You could just play and cheat the system. You could say, uh, how many people voted for you? How many black beans are in the thing there? Oh, here's a gold piece. How many black beans do you see now? <laughs> here's a platinum piece. Do you see any white beans at all? Okay, let's go then. Mm. Which, by the way, is where we got this term spilled the beans from. It's supposed to be like they count up afterwards, but if someone knocks over like the, the bean thing, they get to see how many, like this and that went each way. Oh, You've okay. literally right. spilled the beans. Sure. So, you know, there you go. Your little extra tidbit of knowledge. So, I think for if you have the right group of players, though, who are into like being involved in the campaign... The, uh, having a voting system put in is a very good way, even if they don't get to vote their position into like king or like Caesar or whatever the term is, uh, but get into a position of like, oh, you get to be like elected into the House of Councillors, hmm. and that way your council, you know, you know, like the the king or you know the 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 monarch listens to you this way, or you know at least pretends to listen. It happens. Um, I think that's an excellent way of, of providing, like, okay, yeah, you have to sit for a couple times, you know, a year for, the, like, the, the, you know, the um, the winter session and the spring session sort of thing. Other than that, you, you basically have free reign of whatever you want for the other season, in which case you've got your little bit where you go off and you go adventuring and have fun. But mm-hmm. now we've got some downtime. This other guy wants to create a magic item. What are you going to do? Well, it happens to be that he's creating his magic item during the process of when your position of counselor is in session. So congratulations, yeah, you get exactly. to, to hold political sway, in which case you can just say, okay, what are you planning on doing? What are your positions on these issues you present to them? <laughs> and if you're able to, like, you know, hey, I'm a bard in this area. I'm my charisma is through the roof. I'm just going to make sure that, uh, you know, my views uh, seem very, very well thought out because my charisma score and get more people to, to counsel in that way. In which case, uh, yeah, he's making a magic item over there. You're making a political motion over here. Hmm. And, you know, like you as the, the GM, and you're just, okay, the magic <laughs> item works like this, and you're able to sway enough people, the monarch listens to you, they are now building a, uh, a nice uh, paved road system out west towards the neighboring nation. Or a, or a portal system, do you remember? I do have notes on a portal system. It is, even for most governments, from what I've seen for taxes and all that, a little bit beyond most uh, uh, governmental systems to create. Too expensive. Especially when you start considering that uh, you need somebody about 17th level or higher in 3rd edition to make it work with the proper feats. Hmm. You could make a thing about a uh, magic item bestowing uh, the feat for it, because there are some magic items that do that, mostly for meta magic feats, though. But uh, you can make it work, but it, it, it starts running into the million gold piece mark. <laughs> You'd be better off uh, saving up over the course of a generation, getting yourself a couple high-level clerics, and making uh, uh, like an altar that does uh, allows for a true resurrection once per round. I call okay. it the Phoenix Altar. Yes. It will take about seven years of constant casting time, and, you know, uh, to to make it. But uh, once you got that done, congratulations. Um, the only reason anybody dies is old age. You've changed the world that way. But that's a topic for another day. <laughs> sure. Um, are we running out of time? We have just about hit our limit. Um, so I think with a, like a group of, of players that aren't in want to be involved, they're, they're clearly more of the dungeon-based thing. Mm-hmm. Um, voting still has a decent role. I mean, the electoral process could still work for being a hired goon or a hired anti-goon. It's like, I want to become mayor. Unfortunately, you know, we've got, uh, you know, this this horrible evil person over here that wants to become mayor and they're going to physically intimidate people away. They have a goon squad. I want you to make an example of the goon squad. I want you to make sure that they are found in a horribly beaten place outside of the town limit so that way I don't have to deal with it as, you know, the potential mayor when things happen. And uh, don't tell me how you do it, because I want plausible deniability. I will pay <laughs> you well for your actions. In which case, uh, hey, you you know, 
all of a sudden the players start setting up like, okay, we want to bring them into a warehouse type area. We're going to set the warehouse up like this. They're making their own dungeon. You get to be, as the DM, playing the role of five or six members of the Goon Squad as they play the monsters that attack your players as you reverse the situation on them. And congratulations, you're the DM who gets to play in the game and they made you the dungeon. <laughs> so, you know, nice reversal for every once in a while. Change of pace sort of thing. Um... And, you know, maybe they say, oh, no, no, you don't need to pay us at all there, future mayor. And all of a sudden the mayor owes them a favor. And in that case, mm-hmm. uh, next time they get into a big bad tavern brawl and they get uh, thrown in jail, well, they just happen to get uh, pardoned out in jail. Say, so, okay, I'm like, oh, I'll get you guys out of jail, but you, you got to go hit, like, a dungeon for a few weeks and just let this all die down. Uh, like, you threw a keg at somebody and you knocked them out a window. This is... Like people are talking about this, you guys gotta go find a, like a pit in the earth to go find a bunch of treasure and kill a bunch of goblins and get this out of your system. <laughs> um, but when you get back, I would like to to hear exactly what happened because it sounds hilarious. So they wind up having you know like a little dinner at the mayor's house when they get home and they get to have a nice clean shower and get, you know like whatever get the the swamp guck out of their hair once they get back. <laughs> In which case, you know, hey, you've got a nice political ally and a nice little spot to stay at every once in a while. For the occasional favor. I like it, yeah. Yeah. I imagine, like, it's hard being a mayor because you probably do owe a lot of different people favors. Or maybe the the trick to becoming a mayor is to to always pay your debts or something. (laughs) Like a Lannister, always pay your debts. Yes, that is definitely a good way. Especially for someone who's uh, deep into the, 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 you know, getting into the campaign sort of thing. Make them mayor. Make them put in the situation where, yeah, everything's falling down around their heads. It's not a regular mayor. It's not like the mayor of Victoria here. You, if you're a mayor in a medieval style setting, you have to worry about like goblins attacking, thieves guilds going on, all sorts of things. You have to legitimately worry about the chance of a dragon dropping down on you, <laughs> or semi dragon like creatures. Anything that flies, you have to start realizing, you know, like. Should we wall up the city? What are we going to do? And, and people are asking you about this. Where is the money coming in from? So, you know, you as the DM say, okay, there's much more of the taxes go on here. This works out for the cost of the guards. You have this much spare spending money. Figure out what to do with it as you so see fit. Um, I notice you are not a lawful alignment. You're actually true neutral. So uh, if you're actually going to embezzle any funds, let me know. <laughs> It's a completely uh, you know, viable topic. Should you be able to embezzle? Uh, I should mention our email address: yes. thesimulationist at gmail dot com and uh, s- facebook dot com slash this- facebook dot com slash thesimulationist and youtube dot com slash thesimulationist. And you can leave a review on iTunes for us. The, uh, give us as many stars as you feel we deserve. I'd say just to pick a random number out of the thin air. 14. 14 stars. Out of five. Out of five. Vote three times. <laughs> um, and uh, Stitcher also has reviews, or I guess it's thumbs, I think, on Stitcher. So if you're listening Gruesome. to Stitcher... Just uh, thumbs. Just thumbs. Yeah, I know. <laughs> on the other hand, you get enough thumbs, you make one heck of a gruesome necklace sort of thing. You go with a nice barbarian look that way. Yeah, I hope we get lots of thumbs. And, of course, uh, none of that stuff is... uh, All of that stuff pales in comparison to just word of mouth spreading the podcast uh, to people that you happen to run into in the supermarket. So do that for us. Um, And and we will appreciate it very much. And send us... People at your local gaming (laughs) store, I mean, sort of thing. You see them talking, it was like, hey, you know what, there's actually a podcast. I remember they were talking just about that sort of thing. Go to simulationist.com and... uh, and you can find it and listen to it, and then hopefully it gives you a few ideas, because I think they covered your topic, and they had some rather nice ideas. The yeah. uh, the free-flowing pen of ideas, they call themselves. Um, yeah, and we've done a lot of topics now so after, yeah. So go back and Two search years. it. It's like having a bunch of like uh, those splat books for D&D, except you don't have to pay 40 bucks for each podcast. They're, they're free. I yeah. blew your mind with that, didn't it? We're giving it away for free. Other <laughs> companies would charge you 40 bucks because it's in physical format. All right, so should we wrap up then with final thoughts? On I think the concept of an elected thing, or even a theocracy, you know, especially if you, everyone's all, you know got worships the right god. In that case, a theocracy <laughs> uh-huh. could be very beneficial. Um, you could have some interesting, uh, you know, negative interactions for like, oh, you're a good person, but you don't worship our one true god. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can have so you can. There's a lot of areas to to work with in this whole thing. 
And, you know what, I have yet to actually hear of anybody that did go into a voting thing outside of Gygax's old stuff. It seems to have, have dropped off in favor of killing goblins and going into far out reaches. Yeah. Which is not to say you can't do that. I mean, maybe it's a sort of thing like, um, like this new area has opened up for exploration and, and colonization for people, and so you're going to be, you know, like uh, voting, you know, like uh, amongst like the settlers who gets to become the the lord of the whole place, and uh, the vote tallies up, and congratulations, you're new, the new lord. You got to go into this wilderness, build up some defensive structures, and by the way, there does happen to be a lot of goblins, and they do encourage you to take care of your problems personally. So uh, I guess you're reading Goblin Warrens for the next little while. I guess, um, speaking of goblins or just other people in general, that's the other difference between sort of past democracies, like you think of ancient Greece as, as you know, the, the With their republics, actually. Republi- yeah. Or, yeah, they but really worked the republic. They did have, like, they had voting, but you had to be a citizen and you couldn't be a slave. Right, so there's in which case conditions. don't kill these goblins, make them slaves for your new uh, little sub empire. They don't get to vote. It doesn't matter. Well, and I guess that's the question you can ask if you're if you're creating a campaign world is you can say, well, you know, how far does this uh, vote extend? Like it, it, it's there was a time in America it only applied to white male landowners. Uh, yeah, it's true, and and maybe that makes the most sense for that pseudo medieval setting that it's only the landowners or well, only Well, there citizens. is something to be said about uh, making sure that those who are voting are an informed voter as opposed to like I think I recall seeing that name on a. St- you know, a thing on the side of the road as I was going to work. I guess I'll vote for them. Yeah, yeah, and uh, um, but this name <laughs> sounds familiar. I guess I'll just vote for the incumbent, sort of thing. And you don't really know much about the policies, what they've been doing. So I guess you could make an argument that not everyone gets to vote until they can prove themselves an informed citizen. Uh, well, and yeah, that's an argument that has been had over many uh, over the years. And in the 20th century, we sort of had this idea of universal human rights. Which I don't know if that applies in in D and D worlds, and may, but maybe universal humanoid rights, maybe humanoid rights, yeah, but or maybe not, <laughs> not even human rights. Does the Sphinx get to vote? <laughs> like if the Sphinx is you know like a, you know like a guarding the you know the ancient ruins and allows open for you know some stuff, but in return the Sphinx gets to vote, and it has very powerful amount of votes under its sway. Otherwise, it will start asking riddles and gobbling people up. I like the I like that thought too. That like. You know, election time rolls around, or census time, or whatever, and the all the the monsters who live in the countryside, because it's technically within the borders of the kingdom, they're all s- technically citizens. So the the good monsters, anyways, even the evil monsters, I suppose, if they can they claim the right, <laughs> they all come in in one mass <laughs> unit to make sure nobody tries to gank them for yeah. like uh, fifteen experience points yeah. and pizzas. They yeah. all come into the capital city to to cast their vote and get their thumb painted uh, purple or whatever. Uh, you know, like well, they unless they start Africa. out purple, in which case, you know, <laughs> like they do in Africa, or, yeah. or yeah, they they inky up nice and good, so it, it doesn't wear off right away. Which, by the way, might be an interesting thing. How how do we make sure these people don't vote twice? I own an ink farm, and I have a very interesting suggestion. Um, because you can see from my arms, it doesn't come off, you know, very quickly. I'm off to the elbows in like ink color almost permanently. If someone was to dip their thumb in. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, we'll do that. And all of a sudden, bam, you are selling a lot of ink for the purposes <laughs> of democracy. <laughs> okay, yeah, the ink the ink guy uh, makes out like a bandit. Makes off like a bandit? Yeah, anyway. But what nobody really knows is that this horribly, uh, you know, permanent staining ink, that's goblin lactation stuff, man. They are milking goblins for the <laughs> democratic ink, and it's really kind of creepy. Do well, you I really want to see the dark underworkings of democracy? Dip your thumb in goblin milk? I thought it was going to be something sinister, like, oh, it, now it can be magically tracked by this, a very low-level scry spell that simply detects wherever the ink happens to have well, gone. Well, if you want to research the spell yeah. for that sort of thing, then, then yeah, you could uh, properly lace, uh, like, a, a vial of ink, and then anyone who dips it into that proper vial can get traced on through. So that's, that's a perfectly interesting thing to do, and but that goes into, like, total information and, and you know, like... Uh, data aggregate stuff. Yeah, it's like Batman stuff. <laughs> oh, and then you got to start worrying about the other problems, you know, like in a democracy of like scrying sort of things versus mind control. Like, uh, mm. well, I have uh, an item that allows me to cast a charm person at will. Yeah, um, and every person as they come into the voting booth. <laughs> 
vote for me, vote for me, vote for me. But don't worry, I put a fake little jester head on the top of my wand. I dress myself up, and I am changes the clown. Vote for me, jingle jingle. I suppose. Uh, I mean, one of the things that people used to complain about D and D, and I think it's still some sort of a problem, is that the di- the way the diplomacy skill works is you could. You know, max out your diplomacy skill with you know magic items and a belt of this and a headband of that. To well, let's see. Twentieth level gets you twenty three ranks. Magic item allows you to get uh, at least a plus thirty before it gets into the epic level stuff. Back in third edition, yep. they did make sure to try and nerf that though. That was so getting pretty bad. Basically, so you can convince everybody walking in non magically. You don't have to use magic. So there's no trickery involved. There's, it's just convincing people. But there's just a fun thing, though. It's like, uh, you know, with 23 ranks and 30, that's a plus 53. So you can get them to vote for the Red Dragon. <laughs> it's a minus 20 to your check, but you know what? You've got plus 53. So congratulations. That's still like a guaranteed win for 19 out of 20 people. Uh, the Dragon uh, wins with 95% of the vote. <laughs> Provided it's just one voting place everyone's going to, bam. I suppose, and a dragon, I, red dragons don't necessarily polymorph, but maybe it has a uh, ring of polymorph. And no, in this case, I just like the I just like the fact that the dragon is you know just oh. completely out there. I am a red <laughs> dragon. I am evil. I will tax you like everything just to get the gold in uh, mm-hmm. to my personal lair. Uh, I may wind up eating either you or your farm animals, depending on which one I see first. Uh, but here's my representative. Uh, uh, I call him. Uh, OP the bard and uh, he will uh, discuss my uh, platform possibilities it's like well you know what if you vote for him there's less chance he will eat you because you voted for him and in which case I'll just Maybe. find you know, the one person in 20 that doesn't vote for him and I will have the dragon try and eat them first so mm-hmm. provided you vote for him I mean there's still 5% of the population gone before <laughs> he gets around to you well didn't yeah in, in The Hobbit I think Smaug at one point says, I'm the real king under the mountain. Uh, in which case, that's because he proved his, his kingly worth through uh, trial by combat. Mm. And he yeah. ate a lot of the other people. Yeah. I'm fairly <laughs> certain he ate most of the royal lineage of dwarves. I guess we haven't really talked... We haven't talked about trial by combat, but voting is almost like like a modern... It's a political of combat of sort of thing. Trial by combat, yeah. Or trial by ordeal. Because uh, it is... It's a verbal combat in some cases. Or I'm looking at you, ordeal. America, and some of your presidential yeah. debates. It's interesting. Mm. It's, it's not a physical battle, but it is sort of a battle. It, it is an ordeal. Well, that's the thing. is, It's is a multi-sided battle, too, because it's a battle like yeah. against your opponent and against the apathy of the general voting public. Hmm. So you have to kill the apathy monster while at the same time you know, slinging mud and filth at your opponent. Mm. And you've got to come out looking like the paladin all the time. Right. Well, I, I guess we kind of don't have much more time to talk about this, but... Uh, it's a podcast. We could talk another hour for it if we wanted to, but we well, try and keep this at a nice uh, limited 90 minutes with some interesting leeway in there. Uh, but we will be back again, of course, next week, as we seven always... Seven uh, days! So, yeah, seven days from now. I always think it sounds more ominous if instead of like one week, he's like, okay. we will see you again in seven days' time. Seven days. No more, no less. Unless you don't Unless, click on it because yeah. you're busy doing other stuff, in which case you got two podcasts to listen to in 14 days time I just I just kind of like how it sounds it has like a like a nice ring to it nice little ominous thing like like a, a wizard is never early or late sort of line and it sounds like someone in a position of power would say could you say half a fortnight yeah I never was big on fortnights honestly I like how yeah half a fortnight is a week but <laughs> Well, that's the thing, though, is Fortnite always sounded like such a thing. It's like, oh, boy, when do we get to make the pillow fort? And it's like, what do you mean there's no pillow fort? There's no... I mean, I, I want to build a pillow fort and watch movies. That's my Fortnite. Fortnite. <laughs> what do you mean that's not how it works? And I've always been a little let down ever since I figured out that's not how it was. So I have been forever tainted by the uh, the false promises of the Fortnite. Oh, that's too bad. But I'm an adult now. Every night can be Fortnite if I want it. That's the bonus of being an adult. Okay. Yeah. I can have, like, Fortnite three nights a week. I can make popcorn. I can watch whatever movie I want because I'm an adult. <laughs> but because I'm an adult, I don't do that, and I usually just go to bed at a reasonable hour after not making a fort because I'm an adult. All well, right. On that note, uh, perhaps yeah. I don't know if our listeners listened to this before bed, or, <laughs> but we are off soon enough. I'm off to more coding. <laughs> 
and uh, well, possibly laying in bed because I I've got a nice little netbook for that sort of thing. Okay, cool. Uh, but yes, we're going to end the podcast. We're going to say goodbye to all of our lovely friends listening. Thank you for listening. I've been Josh Eleven. I've been Ryan Kirkby. Uh, send us money. <laughs>